Kellen Mond takes a step forward, and I think we got some real movement on some key position battles for the Minnesota Vikings in their preseason loss to the Raiders. Let's talk about it on the Locked On Vikings podcast. <laughs> You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everybody? Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Locked On Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, your pal, and the kid you copied off in math class. My name is Luke Braun. You can find me on Twitter at Luke Braun NFL. Show is on Twitter at Locked On Vikings. Thank you so much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Welcome back to the homestead, everybody. If you are on YouTube, I'm back doing daily YouTube uploads rather than just the like post practice live streams. Those are pretty fun, though. I was glad I was able to do those, but for audio, hopefully, you can hear a little bit of a difference uh, now that I'm back on my normal setup with the normal acoustics and the filtering and all that. Um, today, we're going to talk about the preseason game. I was there. You can hear maybe a little bit of hoarseness in my voice. Uh, as I will always get when I'm at a loud stadium trying to talk. Uh, or also, I was in Vegas, so don't judge me. <laughs> it was a good time. And being at the game, I felt like I had a pretty good bird's eye view to a lot of stuff. And in particular, and I think the headline of the game, the game that Kellen Mond had. Um, it's kind of a harder one to parse because it looked, I think, a lot better than it was. Um, it did look good, and there were good throws in it, and I do want to give him credit for those. Um, but you kind of saw a lot of the things that I'd been seeing in all of camp with Kellen Mond as well. So, like, how what do we make of that? He made some good throws, and then there were also some, like, bad habits that reared their heads. How do we kind of translate that into an actual evaluation and then translate that evaluation into, like, the action item that we would recommend if we were in the room? That's kind of my thought process with all of these things, right? Um, otherwise you get bogged down in what his passer rating was or whatever. But my question is, what would you have the Vikings do with Kellen Mond right now? And to kind of talk that out, I'll tell you what I saw. Um, I saw a lot more accuracy than I saw in camp. That's really nice. Um, the problems that led to that poor accuracy in camp are probably still there. Um, but look, he, he had some nice balls that he layered in, in there very well. In particular, he threw for two touchdowns, and that's really nice. And he didn't throw any picks, which is also very nice. He didn't throw those really dangerous passes. He's been a little safer than he was last year or even in college. Um, and that kind of goes, I put on, on the Minnesota football party a, a week or two ago, I put on the tinfoil hat, and I essentially said, okay, Kellen Mond is going to be on this like development arc, and there are going to be stages of that arc where he he looks worse, where his... Um, where his like actual level of play, his ability to be quarterback two is worse, but it's because of like how you kind of have to undo things to redo them. Like if you've ever had to learn a new golf swing, sometimes you'll undo everything and you'll spend a whole day on the range, like slicing them every which way, um, before you really start to get it down. I think a lot of that was is the same with Kellen Mond's development. And so where I'm at is that he is on a step of that development. But really, the question at backup quarterback right now with Mannion and Mond is uh, what, like, is this, is the backup quarterback on the roster right now? And there have been rumors that the Vikings have been looking for a new backup quarterback. Um, also, if you missed it, Kirk Cousins got COVID, didn't go to the game, wasn't going to play anyways, so it's not a huge deal. We were always going to see these two. That said, a real quick word on uh, Sean Mannion. Nope. That's <laughs> my evaluation of Sean Mannion. It's pretty clear that like, I don't think he belongs on a 53-man roster right now. Um, and if the Vikings just settled for him at backup quarterback, I think that'd be a pretty big failure. And I don't think anybody really disagrees with that. So we can sort of just leave that at that. He's just really conservative. There were a lot of times where he would kind of go all the way through a progression or not wait for something to come off or just sort of like lock into a check down or something. There were a ton of missed opportunities and missed reads and stuff. Um, and it's just like it's just a very suffocating presence at a quarterback. You can't have that even as a backup. Um, so I, I don't think his level of play belongs on a 53 man roster. And I know Kirk cousins has been like pounding the table for him and stuff. And I respect that. Uh, but nope, 
So back to Mond, where we are at with him is I think like one of my critiques of him coming out and in his rookie year was that he relied on his arm strength too much. He would rocket everything into everywhere. He would test windows that he just will not be able to test at the NFL level. And so a lot of the throws and stuff that he made in college wouldn't translate to the NFL because he is just using his arm strength as a crutch. It was stopping him from learning how to make the reads the right way to kind of progress through the offense the right way because he would be able to kind of take the first read whether it was open or not because he could always rifle it in there but you can't rifle it in there as easily in the NFL and I don't think he had that kind of arm strength like he's a very 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 good arm but it's not the Matt Stafford kind of arm where you like can get away with that crap sometimes um, but even Stafford threw a bunch of interceptions especially early in his career so I wanted him to learn to play it a little safer I wanted him to learn to throw with touch and not only have like I wanted more pitches in his arsenal um, and he threw a lot with a lot of air under them. And in camp, sometimes they had too much air under them and they would go, they would sail or they would be, take a really long time to get there and kind of float up there and be super interceptable. And he would throw interceptions that way in camp. I saw a lot of that in this Raiders game as well. Balls would sail, balls would just take forever to get there. You, you know, there were times when a wide receiver would get open and have a time to be open, and not only would Kellen Mond hesitate, and he was reading the field slowly and thinking more than feeling, but he was layering a bunch of air under it too, so the ball would get there super late, and all that separation would get chewed up as the receiver's sitting there waiting for the ball the DB catches up, right? Um, so that led to some incompletions and some struggles on the offense, but I'm okay with that because that is a point he has to get at. He has now learned to kind of repeal his... Uh, obsession with his rocket arm, learn to throw it with touch, learn to throw with timing and all that stuff, and learn to throw safer passes, don't throw any interceptions in the whole game, that's great, then you can learn to rifle some back in there. And we even saw a little bit of that with one of the two touchdowns to Albert Wilson. So I'm okay with it. Where I'm at right now, I still don't trust him to be a backup quarterback. Um, even though, like, he had a pretty good game but I still saw enough things where I know against a, a number one starting NFL defense, it will be a big problem. Um, I still don't trust that. But I think, right, he is starting to convince, he's well on the way to convincing me that he's worth keeping on the roster to continue development. And that's what I want to see. Is there a path here? Do I see a light at the end of the tunnel? I was at camp of the opinion that I just cut both these guys and move on with my life and whatever bad third round pick it was the last guy let's just move on and click you know cut our losses after this game it's starting to convince me a little bit okay maybe it is worth still stashing him he can't be back up yet but maybe it's still worth stashing him so that's my Kellen Mond thing and talking about that in more detail might be pretty fun throughout the week but I do want to talk about everything else on the roster but first I want to talk to you about Therapy. Therapy is an important thing, fellas, especially. Um, it's something that we don't take very seriously enough, and I am of the opinion that everybody, whether you're perfectly happy with your life or not, should uh, be in therapy of some form. I think it's a great way to find a, a better version of yourself, and who isn't interested in that? So, BetterHelp is the place where you can go to get yourself set up. Now, when I started therapy a couple years ago, it took me a while to find the right person. And a lot of people get discouraged by therapy. Um, you know, they'll go find a person and it's like not right and it doesn't feel right and it doesn't feel good. And they say, ah, therapy really sucks. It's not for me. But you might have just gotten somebody that isn't right for you. And that is why BetterHelp helps you cycle through some people, try some people. I strongly recommend set up a few consults, see who you like, see what you want in a therapist, what you don't want in a therapist. Um, you can log into your account anytime and send a message to your therapy to your to your therapist, and it's free to switch from one person to another with BetterHelp. They will help you find that right person, and they have a special offer for my listeners: get ten percent off of your first month at BetterHelp.com/lockdown. That's ten percent off of your first month of online therapy at BetterHelp.com/lockedon. Hey, thank you all so much for making Lockdown Vikings your first listen of the day. For your second listen, watch, I guess, of the day, go to patreon.com slash NFL. You can find parts one through three of my history documentary. I'm really, really proud of this thing. I worked really, really hard on it. 
Um, I'm still working really hard on the last parts of it, but parts one, two, and three are out. Part four comes out this weekend. Sign up and check that out. Um, we're all the way up through 1978 now, and then the 80s will be this coming weekend. Also check out the Minnesota Football Party. It's an ensemble show with me and Sam Ekstrom and Luke Inman and Arif Hassan, and it's a real good time. Um, continuing on, Vikings lose 26-20 in the preseason, but we don't care about the, the overall result. We never care about that. Not if, not if you listen to this show. So the preseason to me is about individuals. Um, and I, I noticed a little bit, like, what I could check on my phone at the game. People were getting real antsy in the first quarter, second quarter, and the Vikings weren't looking so good. There were penalties. There were problems. Um, but the overall result of the game, like, I don't know how many yards they got in this game. You shouldn't either. Like, you shouldn't care. Um, the overall result of the game is just not that important. And uh, the individual results are, those are what translate out. You know, I mean, there's all sorts of famous examples of like why preseason play doesn't translate to uh, regular season play and all that. And um, like I, most people understand that, but you, you can't watch a preseason game and be like, oh no, the Vikings look bad. That means they will be bad this year. No, particular Vikings look bad. And that means those players might be bad this year, but those players might also not make the team because they look bad. <laughs> And so my question always becomes, okay, what was wrong? Well, they got a lot of penalties. Okay, who got penalties? Josh Metellus got one. He's on the roster bubble. Andrew Booth got a couple. That's kind of him. Okay, that might be a little concerning that his penalty problem has also affected his NFL career like everybody projected it to. You kind of hoped those projections would be wrong. Um, all right, that's an issue. What were the other problems on the team. I mean, some of it was Tyree Stevenson getting washed out in the middle of the field or Jalen Twyman getting washed out. Uh, Wyatt Davis gave up a horrible sack. Like These are guys who are at best on the roster bubble, at worst, not going to make the team. So I'm not too worried about like who are the culprits. Tell me who the culprits are. And the ones we think are going to have to contribute to the Vikings are the ones we have to worry about. And of those players, I think we saw a lot more good than bad. We did not see a lot of those players. Most of the starters uh, sat. Um, Kevin O'Connell said after the game he wanted the uh, starting O-lines and D-lines to get a little bit of work, so you saw a little bit from the starting O-line. There was one sack. I'm pretty sure it was Jesse Davis's fault. Um, and then, But they only played like one series, so they only, all only played like eight plays. In those... Um, Harrison Phillips and Dalvin Tomlinson were phenomenal. They looked great. Um, I think we got a little bit of interesting action from Jordan Hicks as well. Saw, I thought, pretty good play from all the corners kind of up and down the roster. You know, Cameron Dantzler played a couple. He played pretty well. And then you had, like, Chris Boyd had a great game. Um, I thought Caleb Evans, he didn't play much, uh, but he, I thought he was fairly sound when he did play. That, on the outside, the corners kind of up and down were were. Pretty good. And I thought Booth was sticky, although he had one one play where he got both a face mask and a DPI on the same rep. <laughs> so you got to clean that one up. Um, I didn't actually see a lot of people thought the the penalty was like ticky tacky. It was hard for me to see that one live. So I'll take your word for it. Either way, keep your hands to yourself. And it's been a huge problem for for Booth all throughout camp. So I, I wasn't very surprised to see it. Um, but on the whole. Very happy with the outside corners up and down the roster. Very happy with Phillips and Tomlinson. Um, pretty happy with Amir Smith-Marset. I thought he had a really nice day, except he muffed the first uh, kick return he had. Um, and it was, I, I thought, for players like I cared about, I thought it was more good than bad, honestly. Um, and again, I don't, like, they lost the game, but, like, who cares about, like, what happened in the fourth quarter? Like, yeah, it was, they were also losing the game in the beginning, but, like, team-level results just are the least important thing here. So in trying to find, like, other risers and fallers and stuff, um, I'm trying to think of who I thought had nice days. Myron Mitchell, I thought, had a nice day. Um, what, what was interesting to me, so there's been a lot made of the, the wide receiver depth chart. Like, where, where is it after your kind of top four? Jefferson, Thielen, Osborne, Amir Smith, Marset. Those are going to be the four guys that get most of the run, I think, throughout the season. And then you're probably going to roster one or two more 
who those guys are is really interesting. Is it Jalen Naylor, Myron Mitchell, Tristan Jackson? Tristan Jackson comes in at the same part of the depth chart as Amir Smith-Marset, and he got a lot of run in the first part of this game, which is a signal from the Vikings that he is currently winning that job. Kind of a rough day on special teams all around, which is kind of, I don't know, I always see it as the weak weeding themselves out, especially on special teams. If you make bad plays on special teams, like if you're playing on special teams, you're going to be at least on the bubble, if not fighting for a roster spot. And if you're making bad plays on special teams, well, that's not going to help that case very much now, is it? Um, And then there are some other kind of fallers that I guess I want to discuss while we get into the nittier, grittier parts of the preseason game. But I do think that there was a lot of good stuff to really hang your hat on in this one, especially from the depth wide receivers, from the outside corners. Um, If you want to hang your hat on some good Kellen Mond stuff, I would say like step forward is kind of how I would describe that. He has taken a step forward from where I've seen in the past. And the fact that he can take a step forward means maybe he can make more of them. And I'm okay to maybe stash him on the, on the roster while we do that. Um, But I think, I don't know. I don't think I've seen everything I need to see for that. Um, And then, of course, you know, guys like Harrison Phillips and Jordan Hicks and Dalvin Tomlinson did a lot of showing out. Um, Oh, Patrick Jones had a great day. There's a bunch that I'm going to definitely forget. Patrick Jones had a really nice day. He gave up one touchdown. The very first touchdown the Raiders scored was a scramble touchdown. And Patrick Jones took... He took the wrong angle on his pass rush. That's what it is. I think he was he was looping, and he took it like a little bit too wide, and so he sort of left a big lane for you to scramble forward. Um, but like for the whole day, coverage was there, and so it was a matter of if the the defensive line could get home. And I don't think they did a good enough job. They got like sixteen pressures or something really hot, some really high number on the day. But I think a lot of those came later in the play or were somehow helped by really good coverage on the back end. So I think that number might mislead you a little bit. Um, but good day for Patrick Jones outside of that one. He got two, I would credit him with two sacks that he won't be credited for. One was he totally blew up the play. Um, he was like the guy that made the play and then the quarterback scrambled right into the arms of somebody else. He was doomed and it was just a matter of who gets the tackle. But I, I usually want to credit Patrick Jones with those, but it won't show up on the stat sheet. And then he had another one where he made a great sack, but it got, um, called back on some illegal contact, which the illegal contact thing, um, the refs are emphasizing illegal contact in the preseason this year. Um, they're going to call it way, 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 way tighter. I don't know if they're going to call it that tight in the regular season, but we had like four illegal contact penalties in this game. It was really gross and it's very annoying and I don't like it as a viewer. Um, but it's not probably not something to be alarmed about because it's going to affect everybody equally. Um, That said, yeah, the Vikings did get a whole bunch. I want to talk about some of the people who I thought fell, who didn't have as good of a game, um, and we'll get to that. But first, let me talk to you about a good old gramble. Look, I was in Vegas. Of course I grambled on this game. (laughs) I would usually never bet on a preseason game, but I did because I was in Vegas. Uh, But if you're not in Vegas, you can always gramble, just like I did at betonline.net. I did not win my bet, by the way, but maybe you can. If you go to betonline, you can bet on money lines, spreads, whatever. Um, You can bet on preseason games if you're a super degen, or if you're a normal person, you can bet WNBA playoffs are coming up. MLB playoffs are uh, closer than you think. You can bet on anything, tennis, golf, whatever the next MMA fight is, all that stuff, you name it. You can find it all at betonline.net. You can even do player props or even bet right in the middle of a game or event with their live betting apparatus. That is betonline.net, where the game starts. So let's wrap up the day on an absolutely sour note. (laughs) Talk about who who I thought didn't do as well. Um, I think, like, I kind of want to put Kellen Mond on this list as well, but I already explained kind of what I don't like about his game. It's it's all very late. Like, balls are just late. And if he can get balls there on time, um, I think you've got a backup quarterback there. But that's the next thing, and I don't think that that is a... um, I don't think that's a skill that's right around the corner for him, and that's why I'm like still not confident making him QB2. Um, throughout all of camp, or at least the camp that I watched, I thought Sean Mannion had outplayed Kellen Mond. Total opposite in this preseason game. Um, Sean Mannion was an abject catastrophe. It was awful. 
Um, I there's just nothing redeeming, honestly, to say about. It. I guess he delivered reasonably accurate passes, like he put it where he meant to put it. Um, but he like botched a screen once, like I can't like reasonably, like not like consistently, but there were some. <laughs> like I don't know, you'd have to work real hard to say something nice about it. I think what bugged me the most about Mannion's game was the tunnel vision. Um, there were a lot of times where, especially once you break the pocket, once you break the pocket, you are out of the progression. You just have to start looking. Um, and when you, when Mannion broke the pocket, he did on a third goal, I believe. And he sort of started rolling one way. Well, he had, I think it was BC Johnson working the other way with him right on the goal line for a free touchdown, just flip it out to him. But he had already locked his mind onto a corner route, which was covered and not there. And he ended up throwing the ball away, even though there was an open touchdown. That is an egregious and inexcusable mistake. Um, and you can just see the the limiting, and I think I called him earlier in the show, suffocating, I think is the word that I would use for Sean Mannion's presence. I don't think he belongs on an NFL roster. If he helps Kirk Cousins, he helps Kirk Cousins. I don't know if that's worth a roster spot, um, especially if he can't be QB2. And if, if I had to choose a QB2 from either of these guys right now, the preseason game is going to inform that more than camp did because it's more live action. I think it's just a, a better simulation, right? Um, and so I would go with Mond. I would not be happy to go with either of them. I'm still very much in the camp of, of trading for someone, like it is rumored that the Vikings are at least looking into. We actually saw somebody in this game, Nick Mullins, who might not make the Raiders. He's currently getting outplayed by Will Greer, so they might not keep him. Um, so you might not even need to trade, but Nick Mullins could be uh, a guy that I would prefer probably over both these guys. But if I had to choose one of the two right now, it would be Kellen Mond. Um, and that is the preseason game changing my mind there. Other losers of the day, um, Chaz Surratt had some problems with ankle tackles. Um, I thought he did really poorly. Oh, I should mention Brian Osamoa had a really fun game. Um, speaking of guys making tackles, he overplayed some, um, but I, I certainly wouldn't call him a loser. I meant to mention him. I don't know. There's a lot of people I thought played well that I probably just forgot to mention, um, so don't take the their omission as an opinion. <laughs> um, Anyways, uh, yeah, Chad Surratt had a really rough game. Josh Metellus had a catastrophic game. He had one almost pick. He dropped it, but it was a good play. And then he got a penalty on the opening kickoff. Um, he had he gave up a 24-yard catch on, like, third and 23. And that wasn't the only catch that he gave up. I thought he had a totally catastrophic day, which could open the door for someone like a, a random, like a Mike Brown, to, to accidentally make the team as the fourth safety if he can have a good impact on special teams. I, st I don't think Josh Metellus is currently in a cut it, in a we're going to cut you kind of place right now because he would have to get like outplayed by like Miles Dorn um, or, or Mike Brown. But uh, the, the rough one, like if he is going to get himself cut, it looks like this and then other games need to be like this. And if that happens, then we start talking about it. Um, oh my goodness. I got to talk about the running backs. This is a whole thing. This might be a topic for later in the week. Um, but I'll, I'll wrap up with that. Other losers of the day. Wyatt Davis was really poor. I think I talked about Tyree Stevenson was really poor. Um, I thought Luigi Villan was really poor. Um, he did get what I guess I would call like second team reps where he was in the game in like the first half of the game. And I saw him get washed out a lot. I saw like a real, real rough time from him. Um, and then I guess a loser of the game, this is how we'll talk about the running backs. A loser of the game for me was Alexander Madison. Not necessarily because of anything he did. I, he only got a couple of carries. I didn't really notice anything one way or another about them. Um, I, maybe we see something in rewatch, but they seemed pretty ho-hum. And then Kene Wongu looked awesome. I mean, he was reading the plays correctly, which he was not doing last year. And um, he looked just as bursty as always. And he did a lot of conjuring, a lot of Dalvin Cook style, how the world you get the angle on this guy, um, conversions of first downs. You know, he caught like a little out or a little choice route. I believe it was running back choice, which, by the way, is a very dope schematic thing. <laughs> We went over it. If you listen to the shows that I was doing this week over about scheme, about McVay schemes, choice or option routes, little choice routes, um, they're usually you place them wherever you want on the field. You run five, six, seven yards, whatever you want, and then you either sit down against zone or against man, you run away from the leverage. Um, huge, huge, huge part of a McVay offense. If you have running backs do that, that is a, a key part of the passing game. 
and a really, really cool way to get a running back the ball in space. And you really saw it. I think it was a third and 10. He catches the ball four yards in front of the sticks with a guy right in front of him. And Wangu just bursts to the sideline and gets around him, has absolutely no business getting around him like this, but he does. And that's really, really, really cool. Um, And then Ty Chandler also had a great kickoff return. Um, Wangu didn't do any kickoff returning, which I thought was kind of interesting. I mean, I would give the job to Wangu by default, but maybe they're just resting him or something. I don't know. I wouldn't, that would be really rough if there were like a competition there. I think that would be a mistake. Um, but anyways, yeah, the, like Ty Chandler was reading the plays properly. Um, and he took a lot more motion to do it. Like, I still think there's like some wasted motion in the way that he runs. He's not nearly as smooth and efficient as someone like cook. And honestly, how someone like Wangu looks right now, um, and Madison too, like they are, they're all a lot less. There's a little bit of extra bells and whistles going on with Ty Chandler that he doesn't need and rookie stuff. You're putting a little too much window dressing on it. Um, but I really like what I saw there. And so in kind of a roundabout way, you start to see, wow, these two guys on rookie contracts are looking pretty good and we can save about 965 K by cutting Alexander Madison. Does that become worth it? Um, a, a conversation to maybe get into in depth another time. But I've had the hot take that Alexander Madison ends up cut for like months here. So I was on it first, all right? I was on it before it was cool. Um, but it's it seems like it's becoming a big talker for uh, the, the immediate post-preseason game action. Um, there's a lot more to talk about with this game. I mean, I could even go play-by-play and stuff. Um, Perry Nickerson, there's your other big loser. Holy crap, what a catastrophic game. He gets... He he was on the field when he wasn't supposed to, and it got got an illegal substitution penalty, and then um, he gave up a touchdown later in that drive, like just a breakaway touchdown, and that was like absolutely his fault. So, not excellent. There's your last loser of the game. (laughs) Yeah, we can get into more of all this stuff, but tomorrow's Twitter Tuesday, so if there is anything I missed you want to ask me about it, just do that. You can send it to me at Luke Brown NFL or at Locked On Vikings. You can leave a YouTube comment if you are uh, watching on YouTube, you can also send me an email, LockedOnVikingsPodcast at gmail.com, or you can uh, fill out the Google form, which will be in the show notes. I will see you all tomorrow for that. Make sure you check out the history doc, and as always, skull.